yeah, this is just the beginning. I've struggled with how to shoot this video. Google is just kicking off Android 12, a new flavor of material design, a new custom SOC, all on a new phone with a new camera sensor. These are all beginnings and reviews, they always feel like conclusions. I don't want this to feel like the final word on a phone that really should be judged over a longer period of time. And I really want the comments on this video to be a fun place to chat about what this thing can do. So I'm gonna try not to make a huge chunk of this video into an examination of other review trends that I find concerning. I'm gonna try to focus on my opinions informed by my preferences, and we're all going to acknowledge that there is no such thing as a truly objective review because we're humans and we all have bias and preferences. My normal review style is often confrontational because I need to cut off lazy arguments at the knees or I'm constantly having to weed out lame comments on my videos. If you've ever gone complained about my tone, this is your chance to show me that I'm allowed to just like a gadget and tell you why without having to justify every aspect of the gadget. Because I like this phone. I like it a lot. I am a part of Team Pixel and they sent me a 6 Pro to take for a test drive and share my thoughts. Beyond that gift from Google hashtag, there's been no other conversation or review guidance from Google on this phone. But I always have to acknowledge that I have done some paid consulting and hosting work for different Google engineering teams. So make of that what you will. This is a great phone. I think most people should opt for the regular Pixel 6 instead, but people who want some slightly nicer features are going to like what Google is doing. My biggest complaint right up front, I wish Google had not called this a Pro. Just as I complain about iPhones not really being Pro, the Pixel 6 is not a Pro either. It's a Plus or an XL, maybe even an Ultra, but it's not really Pro. I'm, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, let's let's just take a small step back. Let's start off with the hardware because I love this design, but it's terrifying to use out and about. I've said this before on other videos and podcasts, but in this color, Pixel 6 reminds me so much of the Almond OnePlus 7 Pro. And then adding the camera bar on the back, there's something retro futuristic about it. Curves and metal accents, those feel kind of classic into a camera bar that looks like it came from a 1980s sci-fi robot. That works for me. Especially the symmetry where there's no wobble on a table. Really don't like that waka 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 when you try to put your phone down. But going with curves, they are a bit harder to hold on to. This phone, is slippery as heck. And the camera bar also gives me some concerns for how pieces of glass line up. I'm trying to find a good rear camera guard or skin, you know, something with, with cutouts for the sensors that can mask the edges of those glass pieces and protect this overall strip. If you find anything good, uh, drop me a comment down below. Short story long for how much I like this as an industrial showpiece, and it, it does, it deserves like a little glass box on a Lazy Susan under museum lighting. You're gonna need a case. I'm not gonna be taking this Pixel out of a case. It's just mandatory. And we're already seeing a lot of these phones end up with cracked glass on the Pixel subreddits and on the forums. I normally wouldn't stress design as much because of the last point I just made about needing a case, but I feel this is important for this year's phone. This is the first Pixel that feels like a uniquely built phone. Google could always hide behind other manufacturers when they were selling the Nexus. The first three years of Pixels were largely still HTC and LG exercises with Google labels. The Pixel 4 started to feel a bit more unique, but then we kind of had a holding pattern year for the Pixel 5. Getting here, this feels fresh. It starts us off on a whole new design language for both hardware and software. This feels like the first time the Google hardware team has really put themselves out there and made their phone. And that brings us to the software, because this is not 
stock Android. It's a Google-y version of Android 12. It'll be as separate a flavor as any other manufacturer skinning their phones. I don't know if we'll really see what true flat stock Android 12 looks like until Sony and Motorola start putting out some updates. Google is in the unenviable position of launching a new operating system, a new material design, and a whole series of new apps and widgets with this one phone. And it's not all perfect. Now, I am the nerd who misses the density of elements on my Pixel 4 XL where my entire settings list was available without scrolling. It doesn't change my life much to have to scroll a bit on the Pixel 6, but I'd prefer being able to set UI and font sizes small enough to one screen that panel of options. There are, of course, going to be some polarizing opinions on the new notification shade. I'm less frustrated having a bit of padding on those toggles. Again, it doesn't rock my world only having eight controls instead of 12. And I can appreciate that there's a clearer identification for controls by giving them a little more space. It might make this easier for some people to use and doesn't much change how I use my phone. I do not believe that good UI design depends on packing as many toggles as possible into one space. And the obvious attempt by Google is to make the whole notification shade more modular, more adaptable panels and buttons that respond to the user's needs from moment to moment. In the first two weeks that the phone has been in people's hands, I don't believe Google has fully realized that idea, but I think it's pretty easy to see what they're working towards. Every UI change on every phone has come with some teething pains. I can't point to any serious usability issues there, it's just a little different. Material U is absolutely a change of pace and changes can be polarizing. In this earliest incarnation, I can totally appreciate some of the stumbles folks have been complaining about, especially the Android faithful, you know, the diehard that really enjoy granular customizations. I'm trying not to just slap Nova Launcher on because I'm familiar with that. And I'm trying to use this the way I think Google intends. There's a raw glimmer of an idea that I think is kind of exciting. Like, I'm a Star Trek nerd, and an LCAR's interface would be sort of rad. You know, modular design and UI elements that adapt to the specific needs and requests of that moment, and controlled through large buttons on touch displays. You know, the thing is, Star Trek LCAR's is a weird look of only futuristic rectangles and bubbles. As Google starts shifting the function of panels and toggles, there's something interesting about dynamically shifting the aesthetic of the phone too. Boy, howdy, we're not there yet. But as a first incarnation of this idea before many apps have started adopting that kind of aesthetic, it's already kind of fun to play with for wallpapers, color accents, and icons. The reason I'm, I'm not coming down too hard on some of the rough edges, I think Google has earned some consideration for regular updates and refinement. Both my Pixel 4 and 5 have gotten noticeably faster and more powerful after updates. Patches are delivered with regularity and Google is already aggressively updating more through Google Play, Android system intelligence, and private compute services. They're not sitting on some of these stability patches waiting for a larger OTA when a specific component is being addressed. Increasingly, that update is being sent directly as an app update. I don't know where we got the idea that just because Google is spending some more on advertising that somehow, magically, the Pixel 6 would arrive 100% bug-free, perfectly understood, bring all kinds of new features and exciting new software, but also be immediately familiar and completely accessible and still undercut every other flagship phone's price. Hey techies, we never hit Sam Apple with that kind of energy. But and there I go again, reviewing reviewers. I have digressed. The Pixel 6 is only weeks old, and it's already starting to feel more like an organism evolving than many other phones. I think that's critical because I feel the major claim of a Pixel is it should be an ambient computing companion. All Android phones can be a platform for Google services. This should stand as the showpiece for hardware and software synergy to demonstrate those newest Google services. There are all these little actions that you just take for granted when using a Pixel. They're not measurable, I can't time them or benchmark them, but they make interactions easier 
and you miss them when you use another phone. Now, I'm already hooked on speech to text with voice commands for sending messages. It's so simple. It works great. Call screening is just fun and having some additional advanced options for managing spam calls. That's super handy in an age of robocalls. I haven't had an opportunity to play much with wait times or direct my call, but it's at least refreshing to see a smart phone bring some evolution to the act of making a phone call. Good software is worth far more than many of us really appreciate in our gadget reviews, and this is one area I hope Google continues to differentiate. If the mission of making a custom SoC is to better facilitate these kinds of advancements, then increasingly we should see Pixels do things that other phones won't be quite capable. It used to be we'd see an amazing new assistant feature or live caption on a Pixel first, and then six months later it would be on every other phone. We'll have to see how Google handles that moving forward. Put it on your calendar. Let's chat again at the launch of the Pixel 8. My hypothesis is that the gulf between Pixels and other Androids will widen. When I worked with TK Bay to do some early performance testing, I was very happy to see that Google's focus on machine learning, these tensor cores, this new SoC did not come with too extreme a penalty for traditional compute power. I've been saying this for a while now, but since roughly 2018, folks have been grossly over buying power they're not really tapping. A phone from two years ago can still often hang with laptops in some surprising heavy lifting situations. You can watch that breakdown on Tensor that we produced. It's two videos and those are also linked below. Short story long, it's plenty capable. Wins a few of the the races we put it in but delivers respectably consistent performance over the whole of some challenging tasks. It's now on Google to demonstrate that their custom hardware really will deliver unique experiences over future updates. We've desperately needed more competition in this space, so even if you're not going to buy a Pixel, if your next phone gets longer windows of software support, Google and Samsung contributed to that competition in a real big way. In chatting performance and using a custom SoC, I personally was most worried about the radios. In operation, this is one of the fastest phones I've tested on my home Wi-Fi and hangs out at the top of the pack for sub-6 5G. We have those ugly memories of how awful iPhone radios were for years, and not using a Qualcomm SoC, it could have been a disaster here. But I think we're squeezing competitive performance and signal stability out of this hardware. The current issue might be power management, and this is something I think also needs a bit more polish. In daily operation, the battery is decently solid. It won't win battery of the year, but it's not cratering unexpectedly. The first couple days were rough setting it up, but now that I'm in it, I found some surprising longevity. More than once managing not quite two full days of my kind of use. But I think there are some issues with standby power. When the phone is doing nothing, I will occasionally see more than 1% per hour battery drain. I've been digging into settings and toggling notifications, but I kind of feel that betrays the mission of a Pixel. Just a little. I had the same philosophical issue with the Pixel 4. If you remember my reviews back then, we can't at once claim this is the most streamlined and accessible version of an Android phone, and then also expect owners to be super sleuths that can dig through different categories of settings to tweak things. Like, like those ideas just don't mesh. So I hope Google can spruce up background services and data connections to minimize some of this battery loss. This matters a little more on a Pixel because the charging is pretty slow. I didn't get a new Google power brick. Honestly, I didn't even try any of my other Pixel charging bricks. I should probably do that. But passing back and forth between some of my more expensive and fancier chargers, it's just crazy slow to top off. Probably for better long-term battery health, but, but I don't charge overnight. I only plug in when needed. And most phones these days can get a solid day of use with about 20 to 30 minutes on a charger. You need to be more patient with a Pixel at present. And this brings us to the cameras. I have a lot of thoughts, but I'm not quite done finishing up all of my testing. You know, I'll have the standalone camera deep dive out soon-ish, but I almost feel like I should wait for another major update or two. Google has been training their software on a specific sensor for years, and they've gotten amazing results out of that older camera hardware. Switching to this newer 
larger sensor, I think it needs a little more conditioning time. This was true when Samsung dumped a big sensor in the Galaxy Ultras. It's true of Apple using a newer sensor in the iPhone 13 Pros. All of your post-processing needs to be tweaked for that larger sensor. A lot of this still feels like the same flow we had on the Pixel 4 and 5. That makes sense for some things, but it doesn't for others, like low light photography. This sensor should soak up a lot more light, but your capture times are still similar to a Pixel 5a. You might need to hold still for seven seconds or longer, depending on the lighting conditions, where a OnePlus with a smaller sensor can nail a similar shot in about half the time, or a Vivo with the same sensor Sensor, but a dedicated photo coprocessor can speed this up quite a bit too. There's also the marketing aspect of calling this a 50 megapixel sensor, but at the time this review was shot, there is no way to capture a 50 megapixel JPEG. When we see these large megapixel numbers, 48, 50, 108 megapixels, basically they're all designed to spit out 12 megapixel images as the standard shooting mode. When you capture a higher res image, it's not the same as a 50 megapixel image on a traditional camera because groups of colors are blocked and binned and there's a different demosaic process that needs to happen for an image to finish. You will get more info than if you zoom in on a 12 megapixel capture, but it's not the clarity we would get from a traditional 50 megapixel sensor. But that full resolution is is not the default capture for any phone. Even the RAW files will spit out 12 megapixels because that's the true operation of what these sensors are designed for. But I think there should be an option for higher res capture, especially if you're gonna slap 50 MP on the box. I think it's silly to complain about it only being 12 megapixels when the areas of photography that are affected by a larger sensor are still demonstrated here. There's roughly 60% more surface area on the Pixel than on an iPhone 13 Pro's main camera. Now that has an effect on dynamic range, pixel level detail, and depth of field. But to really get everything out of the sensor that we can, it'll need some updates. At present, Pixel 6 joins the Vivo as an incredibly fast indoor shooter. We don't have any of the shutter lag from a Samsung, nor do we have that image reset after the shutter's hit from a OnePlus. The fun new camera features are fun to play with. Motion blur, it's kind of nifty, you know, kind of streaking objects that are moving in your frame. And Magic Eraser is a handy tool when used sparingly, especially for some of my neighborhood shots, where as soon as you pick up a camera, if anyone else is around, it's like they're watching you closely. And now if they're kind of in the background, you can kind of just scrub them out from staring down your camera lens. <laughs> like, lady, I'm obviously trying to take a photo of my daughter here. I'm not trying to snoop on you. So sure, you can dump your photos into other apps or programs to get similar editing options, but isn't that exactly what we complain about when we talk about average people doing more complex tasks? Aren't we happy to see these tools streamlined and made more accessible in the phone camera? You say only Apple is allowed to do things like that. Interesting. Oh, sorry, there I go again. The most critical difference between a Pixel 6 and a 6 Pro is obviously the telephoto, another decently large pixel binning sensor on a periscope lens. Google is restricting the range, which I think is a good idea. You know, none of the marketing hype for 50 times moon zoom, because those images are often kind of garbage all the way out to the far end of that zoom. Now, there's still an oil painting effect smoothing over that much of a pixel crop, but this is honestly pretty good performance. It makes the ultra wide feel a bit older, especially at night from the main camera to the telephoto shots come out bright and detailed. The ultra wide is kind of pokey. If you shoot heavy from your phone and you want that extra bit of reach, the telephoto on the 6 Pro is absolutely worth the higher price tag IMO. There's just so much to cover on these cameras. I'll have to finish that all on a standalone video. And I've been rambling for a bit. We should probably land this plane. My thoughts on the Pixel 6 Pro are still forming, but this early use has been refreshing. It's something a little different. I don't 
think it's a pro. I, I feel like we'd need more camera controls and options or you know a video out through the USB-C to access a desktop mode. I mean, it's maybe a pro assistant. As a ubiquitous computing idea, it's approaching pro secretary kind of gadget use. I'm getting a bit silly, but the phone is built on a promise, and that's what you're buying. It sounds really clever to say things in our videos like, buy a phone for what it can do today, but I don't think we really mean that. A major selling point of a Samsung or an Apple is software support and updates, and we don't mean just minor bug fixes and security patches. Out of all the Android manufacturers, Google has done the best job recently of bringing new features to their phones and improving performance over time. I don't think it's much of a risk to recommend folks buy a Pixel with that in mind. Every phone needs updates and support over time, and there are always rough edges or issues to address. That's no different here. It's no better, but it's certainly no worse. And you get the benefit of being at the front of the line for all the new features Google is working on. My Pixel 3a has Android 12. Why doesn't the Samsung Galaxy A50 have a perfectly polished build of Android 12 and One UI 4? I thought Samsung was gooder at software. <laughs> Sorry, that's the last snarky bit. I, I promise, I, I just couldn't help myself. Like I said at the top of this video, I think most folks should be shopping the Pixel 6 over the 6 Pro. But there are some fun reasons to step up to the higher level trim of the 6 Pro. I'm not gonna try and convince you or justify a $300 price difference between the two, because I kind of look at this like nicer cars. A few more bells and whistles, one excellent performing camera sensor, just wanting to own something a little nicer. Plenty of valid reasons for stepping up to the more expensive phone, especially for how well the 6 Pro competes against most other phones on the market at just under $1,000. People buy Toyota nine to one over Lexus. That doesn't make Lexus a fail. We shouldn't be surprised that globally more people buy less expensive phones over more expensive phones. And that's the gig. When I got the Pixel 4 XL, it genuinely rivaled my use of LG phones, and it kept my SIM card longer than any other gadget I'd reviewed that year. I don't know yet if the Pixel 6 Pro will do the same, but I know it's gonna be a really interesting ride. So stay tuned for some upcoming videos on camera performance, audio performance, and I'm about halfway through writing a script comparing the photography of the Pixel 6 Pro, Vivo X70 Pro Plus, and the Xperia Pro I. And that's gonna be brutal. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. Greatly appreciate all the support. Those of you who are clicking on the links down underneath or maybe shopping a little merch, that kind of stuff really helps keep production rolling on this channel. Full list of all my affiliates and partnerships on somegadgetguy.com or you might consider, just maybe, joining the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically a collection of the coolest tech pals in the galaxy. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at some gadget guy on the Twitters and the Twitch, uh, Facebooks and the Instagrams, and I will catch you all on the next review.